Are 3D printers tools or are they toys? It's a good question because the vast majority of 3D printers which are sold are open air printers and they're sold to people who think they're gonna get into a hobby and they print a few things that they download from Thingiverse and then the printers probably just go in the closet and get forgotten about. So those are toys, right? But some people use those very same printers and they're able to run print farms and successfully produce parts that they can sell on Etsy or eBay or something like that. Now, don't think that you're gonna be successful. There's a lot of competition for print farms and there's not very many products which are viable. So uh, it's a competitive game to get into and I'm urging caution there. But yeah, okay, so they can be tools. The problem with open air printers is you're pretty much constrained with printing with PLA or PETG. Those are the two plastics that are very easy to be successful with and they both uh, are considered, I would consider them to be low performance plastics. Now, PLA is pretty incredible. It is quite stiff, it's quite strong, it has a lot of great things, characteristics going for it, but it is a lower temperature melting plastic, which means that if you leave it on the dashboard of your car, it will get into the glass transition zone and it will slump and get all floppy and rubbery. Um, and also it suffers from really bad plastic creep, which means that if you make a functional, like a structural component, which is constantly under load, the plastic will just glacially, like a glacier, just moves, it'll move really slowly over time and just slump out of the way from the load. And so it's not ideal for functional parts and P, uh, PETG is similar, okay? So you can get carbon fiber impregnated PETG, you start to get better, but that gets pretty expensive. And yeah, so there are just so many things, so many variables that go into it and what we really wanna do is print out of these same plastics that are used in all of the uh, professionally you know, injection molded parts that we have you know, at our disposal all day, every day. So these would mostly be your nylons that are impregnated with either glass fiber or carbon fiber. You can get really fancy and get into polycarbonate uh, and you can glass fiber, carbon fiber those as well. Um, there's lots of palm if you, if you really wanna get crazy with it. Um, really, really crazy would be PEEK, which is a very high temperature uh, thermoplastic. But, you know, to print any of these, what we need is a heated chamber. And the reason for that is that as you lay your layers down, they shrink. So they get laid down and it's kind of like stretching a rubber band as you lay them down and they want to shrink back in. And as you build successive layers and all the layers are trying to shrink in, what ends up happening is they peel up off the bed like that. And that's one problem. That's the major problem that you, you will see from shrinkage is bed, bed peeling. But you also get layer separation up higher in the part where the geometry of the part that you're printing uh, gets kind of thin. This is where you'll notice it. And the layer lines will just do this. So instead of having nice layer lines like my fingers that lay on top of each other, they split and there's a gap. So yeah, there's a big problem with shrinkage and the way to mitigate that is to print in a heated chamber. And I've said it before, you need your heated chamber to be sealed and insulated. This is just so obvious. Your house has seals on the door when you shut it. You've got insulation in the walls. If you have a 3D printer that you're trying to keep at a high temperature, why wouldn't you seal and insulate this as well? And so uh, I'm not seeing many sealed and insulated solutions on the market, but I am seeing this printer here, which is the Chidi iFast. Before we even get into it, I need to give massive credit to Chidi for even attempting to do what they're trying to do. Nobody else is trying to address this market like a sub $3,000 enclosed printer with a heated chamber for printing high performance plastics. It's just great to see an entrant into this marketplace and I'm really happy with that. But you know, there's a lot of things that could be desired. For instance, you see the lights here? They're just sort of falling down. They were they were stuck. It's a sticky, you know, backing to those. And I can put them back in place, but in a heated chamber, the heat cycling is going to cause those things to fall down again. On the back side here at the power plug, we can see light leaking through. Look at that. It's shining on my finger, which means that is a massive hole for air leakage. This is absolutely not a sealed printer. Now, maybe that little hole isn't so tragic as far as air leakage goes. It's just a little flow, right? You can see my finger poking through another massive leakage point, air hole. So we're gonna get some stack effect there where cool air down at the bottom is gonna be flowing into the power outlet and it's going to be venting right out here just like a chimney. And there is a double wall going on here with the printer, but it's not insulated. And you know, this groove here, which is where the 
catch for the, the bed that goes up and down and rides in this groove. So it's not like we're keeping the heated air just right in here. It's easily flowing back and forth inside of the double wall. So it's not sealed and it's not insulated. On the back side of the printer at the top is the filament spool mounting location and it comes with these arms that bridge the gap between the legs that can be stowed away by sliding this down and doing that so you know you can more easily transport it I guess but who's going to be transporting this massive printer it's going to be staying wherever you put it this is not a portable printer so I don't know why we needed some sort of a fancy solution like that it can be kind of difficult to feed the filament through that tube you have to get it nice and straight and then it will just go right on through but it doesn't always work out that way the filament path isn't perfect and second of all it takes a 90 degree turn right here as it comes off the filament. So what happens when you're low on the filament? The filament's gonna go straight down and have to turn 90 degrees. So as you pull against that, it's likely to break right there. And then it takes another 90 degree turn right here as it goes into the actual extruder. As this pulls, it's going to be putting pressure on it just like so. So the filament path is not ideal. I guess it works. And that's how most of the things on this printer seem to be. They just work, just barely, but they're far from ideal. Hey look, it has a webcam right here, but it's totally not integrated into the software. It's there, but you can't really use it. The dual nozzles down here can actuate up and down, and that happens based on this arm right there. So as it slides to the end of its travel, it pushes, and you can watch. You guys see the nozzles changing right there? So. What happens is that lifts the nozzle up like let's say one millimeter, but it's still gonna ooze and you have two nozzles with all of the hardware associated with them constantly moving. So that is a lot of inertial mass that you wouldn't have moving around there if you have an IDEX. So an IDEX independent dual extrusion where one of the nozzles parks on the side of the printer while the other nozzle is printing. And then this nozzle goes and parks on this side and this nozzle comes out to print. So this is reminiscent of designs from Stratasys and it's the year 2022, we shouldn't be copying Stratasys' ideas from like, what, 1996 <laughs> or something like that, when Stratasys first came up with this. I've taken the backing plate off of the high temperature hot end assembly here, and you can see just how that works. This plastic bar slides back and forth, and as it does, it pushes down on these bearings, and so one gets lifted up and one gets pushed down. It's a clever design, but this weighs a lot. The filament feeding mechanism is basically a, the Bontech design with the dual gears and it's direct drive, which means it does not have a gear ratio associated with it. And that gives the possibility that we could get the cogging issue I've talked about previously on this channel, where if you're really printing at high speeds, which you won't because this is too heavy to print that, that fast, that quickly. But uh, you could see artifacts on your prints because there's no gears. So yeah, that's a problem. And because this whole thing is going to be functioning inside of a chamber with very hot air around it, this is an inadequate part cooling solution. So this would be really great if it was in the open air, like all of the printers that we're used to, but I think we're going to get heat creep issues where the filament softens farther up the filament path and we're going to get jams. And I think that Major Hardware, in his review, actually had that problem. So this is the one we have issues with. It's not printing the best. If you want to look at this fan showdown fan, it kind of looks okay, but it's very, very thin. Um, there's some major under extruding issues going on with this one right now. So we got to, we got to kind of figure that out. And would you read that? Use a circulating fan to reduce the temperature in the case. We don't want to reduce the temperature in the case. We want to up the temperature in the case and prevent clogging. That's what I'm talking about with the heat creep up here in the in the nozzle. So yeah, they're absolutely having a heat creep issue and they're claiming this is a feature, not a bug. Part cooling is par for the course with the single-sided. Uh, it could be a little bit closer. I would like that. If the jet of air was closer to the nozzle, it would be more effective. But all in all, I don't think that that's gonna be anything less performance-wise than the vast majority of printers out there, except that this again is happening inside of a heated chamber, so that could affect things. It needs to be superior, not par for the course, because it is a heated chamber. And speaking of heated chambers, plastic softens in a heated chamber. It gets closer to its glass transition. And so the fact that this very functional bar here, riding on these pulleys, is made out of plastic, 
I mean, it's probably, it looks like nylon to me, but still, uh, it's not going to go the distance. I do want to give Chidi credit for the amazing bed. This thing is fantastic. Flexible steel. Look at all those magnets in there. They just, that plate, that build plate is not going anywhere during the print. And, wow, you, if you pinch yourself with it, you're going to give yourself a blood blister. It's so firmly mounted. Fantastic. The thickness of the aluminum plate means you'll get really good heat dispersion. You won't have any hot spots on this bed. It will have a uniform temperature across the entire surface. Here's the filter fan that keeps uh, the microparticulates inside of the unit, supposedly. On the back side, we can see light from the chamber shining through. So that is not gonna be a very good filter. And again, with the sealed and insulated nature that we need to really have good uh, temperature control inside of the chamber, that's not it. The printer comes with a bunch of extra stuff in the box, like this toolkit that has extra nozzles even, and wrenches and whatnot. There's a network cable and there's the plug for that but I don't think the implementation is done very well in the software. There's a secondary heated build plate which has the PEA powder coating on it instead of this build tack material and most interestingly it comes with these two sealed filament spool holders. These are not heated filament dryers although Chidi does sell that for 75 extra dollars. You are meant to mount these to the back of the printer on this shelf like so, which means that your printer is gonna sit this far off the wall. And you're also gonna have to come around the back of the printer to load your filament, so that's very inconvenient. So we have a super heavy printhead, which is going to lead to ringing or ghosting. And we've exacerbated that by spring loading the belts using this spring tensioning mechanism. So the belt will expand and contract there every time the printer has to change direction in the Y axis. The printer comes with the low temperature extruder assembly where both of the nozzles cannot go above like 265 degrees Celsius. But it does come with a separate printhead that has two high temperature print nozzles on it. Swapping these components is anything but a quick change though. There's even a long drawn out instruction sheet here for how to make it happen. If I was going to print with the low temperature hot end here with the two nozzles, then I'm required by the printer here to remove the top plate. So this is effectively now an open air printer. The inertial mass of this very heavy print head and the oozing from whichever nozzle is not currently active all over your part means that this solution is inferior to IDEX. So why would you get an open air printer that's inferior to IDEX and yet costs $2,100? For context, here is the massively overpriced Prusa i3 Mark III and you could purchase three of these open air printers for the price of a single Chidi iFast. So in my estimation, the only value of this printer is the fact that it has a heated chamber for high temperature plastics. And this whole separate low temperature hot end is just a gimmick and I'm not gonna waste my time using it as an open air printer. See what I mean about the filament boxes awkwardly sticking off the back? We got the red PLA from Cheaty Technology and let's get some of that loaded here. I gotta awkwardly reach over the machine. I guess that's not too bad dropping that in there. I gotta kind of feed it up. I really am sort of stretched across the printer to make this happen. You can't really tell, but that's that's the that's as far as I can reach. I'm just gonna go around back. Yeah, I don't really think this is something that you can reasonably accomplish from the front. Now I do have to say that this is not the easiest thing to spin. So the fact that it takes quite a bit of force to pull that filament through there, if we had a sudden movement of the print head, I could see it snapping the filament off right there, or at least putting a nice crease in it. If you didn't already know this about me, I'm sure you figured it out from watching this video. I love to geek out on all of the minute little details in these 3D printers. They are simple machines, so the sum or the whole will be the sum of its parts, right? There's no soul in these printers. The question is whether or not these flaws or faults that I've found are good enough. So the machine could potentially perform just fine despite its flaws. And to see if that is the case, I'm going to urge you guys 
to watch the other reviews out there. There's a great one by Cloud42, link in the description, as well as one by Modbot, link in the description. So yeah, uh, don't just watch my video because I'm not super keen on putting the machine through its paces for you know many days or I'm just gonna do two quick test prints and that is not a true indication of what the machine is capable of or where it's going to let you down. Now, in order to do the test prints, we need to open up the Cheaty Print program, which is, I think, a reskinned version of Kira. It's not as good as, as actual Ultimaker Kira. However, it is tailored to this machine, which means it's easy to set up dual color or dual material prints. And it's got all of the built-in scripts for switching the nozzles and all that kind of a thing. So um, you're pretty much going to use this. If you buy this printer, this dumbed down um, slicer is what you're stuck with. It is possible to use all of the other um, slicer softwares out there to run this machine, but it will be a challenge to figure out the scripts. And um, it's not something that Cheaty has set up and made easy for you to do. They want you to use this software, and so I'm going to proceed with this review as if the software is the only way to run this printer. And uh, with my first impression here, the software is um, par for the course with the rest of the machine. Apparently, I've been looking at the older version. When you try to download the latest version of the Cheaty Tech Slicer, you get a Google Drive warning that you're probably downloading a virus. And when you try to install it, you get a warning from Windows saying that you're probably installing a virus. So eh, this is kind of sketchy. But they did send me a printer, so I'm going to risk my computer getting a disease and I'm going to install this anyway. By the way, Cheaty wants me to tell you guys about the filament dryer, which they have designed and sell to mount to the back of this printer. You're looking at it right here. And this is a nice solution because we all know that the high temperature filaments love to soak that moisture right out of the air and lead to terrible print quality. So this is a very nice thing to have. As well as this filament that they produce, which is this PA12 carbon fiber nylon filament. Looks like some nice stuff. So check that out. Links in the description. All right. Leveling this machine is very slow and tedious. You have to wait for the bed to drop all the way to the bottom. Look at how slowly it moves. I mean, it's so slow you can barely even see it going. Yeah. And then it's got to come all the way back up to the top. There are manual adjustment knobs. There are three of them. And then you have to set the, um, I would call it baby steps or Z offset or something, even though there is no sensor. So there's no automatic uh, bed leveling. And that beeping, I don't know, the, the machine just beeps. It just beeps. I don't, it doesn't tell me why it's beeping. It just does this. It does it when you put, you know, filament in through the, uh, these are the filament detecting switches inside of there. And it's just, it's incredibly kludgy, you guys. Like it appears that this is gonna work, but it's, it's not fun. This is not fun. So when I get this set just perfect, it's going to be wrong as soon as I heat the bed up more substantially. If I click on the printer, I can select this calibration test print, which was provided by Keedy themselves, Cheedy. This was built into the printer. So if I press play on this, it should work flawlessly. Look, I have two filaments loaded in through the, um, the filament detection switches. These are PLA, by the way, even though these are the high temperature nozzles, uh, I can only do this calibration test print with PLA because it doesn't have a high temperature option. But we'll just play that and you'll notice that nozzle number one, that being the nozzle on the right here, right should be nozzle number two, but the right nozzle there is nozzle number one and it is up to temperature, yet nozzle number two, no temperature, no, no change. So we're just gonna let this print. Hopefully it'll get nozzle number two there up to temperature by the time it starts printing. Okay, it's raising the bed, and one thing that I've figured out is it lays a line across the front in the one color, then it lays the line back the other direction in the other color. So we're gonna watch it here, try to lay down the white. That's what it's trying to do, lay down white. So it couldn't lay down the white. That was skipping. It could not feed the white because there is no nozzle temperature whatsoever there. The red is doing just fine. Nozzle number one seems to be okay. 
and I know from experience here that I can get the test print to print successfully by changing in this menu only. So this is the only menu in the whole printer where I can actually change the temperature on nozzle number two. I can click here, click, uh, let's go 200, but watch this. Enter. It's going to change it to 128. That's not what I said. I said 200. Let's try that again. 200. Check. Now it'll hold it at 200. And it wouldn't even turn that nozzle on if I just let the print run automatically. On the test print here, I can already see this jagged edge that it's printing. You see it pop out there for a second. Jagged edge. That means I'm printing too close to the bed, but there's absolutely no way to adjust that on the fly. So there's no baby stepping, z ha, z stepping, whatever you want to call it. When you set that level during the leveling procedure, that's your only chance. Even though the bed heats up, and when it heats up, it gets closer to the nozzle. So this is just so kludgy. It's so amateur, and it's just it's not indicative of a $2,500 machine. So there's the completed calibration print, and up here I'm supposed to go to tools, and there's supposed to be a calibrate E right here, and it's not there on the menu. All right, the build plate is still attached, but if I take it off, the printer just screams at me. Oh, it kind of stopped screaming. There you go. What is this? Like, you bump it, and it screams at you. This printer makes no sense. Why are you yelling at me? Why won't you tell me why you're yelling at me? Does it have to do with these? No. God, this is frustrating. So here's my calibration prints, and yet I can't use this information to do anything. So if I go with the gear icon and then preheat, I can set the bed temperature. I can set the uh, extruder temperature for nozzle number one. By the way, nozzle number one here on the right. Tell me how that makes any sense. In China, do they read from right to left or something? But this is all in English. There's English. There's English written there. There's English written on the back. So why would you read right to left? It should be left to right. This should be nozzle number one. That should be nozzle number two. But hey, I digress. Nozzle number two here, which should be the white one, is unchangeable. I can't do nothing with it, so how am I supposed to prime it? There's the lever you push down back here to uh, to sort of release it so that you can feed the filament through, and it's not possible for me to prime that by hand. And I don't really see an easy priming functionality built into this. So the firmware here knows that I've got the high temperature nozzles physically installed in the printer and I've tried to do the calibration print, but um, you know, it just won't let me calibrate. So friendly reminder here, apparently I'm supposed to contact Cheaty because they want to update the firmware. They want to teach me how to do that or something. I don't know, but it seems to me like it should have come uh, like this. Now, keep in mind that I received this printer six months ago. I have been so reluctant to do this review because I, you know, I started running into these problems and I just didn't want to do this job. Uh, that, yeah, basically I probably have six month old firmware, so maybe they fixed this by now. So if you get this printer, probably you will not have this problem. But even if you do, you'll be able to contact them. But I think you're going to have a very intimate relationship with the Cheaty support. All right, I'm not going to be deterred by this setback. I'm going to do a nylon print here, so I need to switch out the red PLA filament for nylon here in extruder number one. I'm not going to use extruder number two, so, you know, because I can't get that calibrated. So let's just see if we can get something to work with a single extruder. And now I have a problem because I need to get the white and the red filament out. So let's preheat, but, oh, that's right, I can only preheat the, um extruder number one with the red so that white filament is stuck in there until I do a second test print and get to it that way this is such a disaster all right so we're zero percent just starting this print on this carabiner design of mine I'm using this natural nylon I don't know what this stuff is it's cheap from China but the chamber here up to 70 degrees the bed temperature 80 degrees and the nozzle 285 degrees so it should be printing okay onto this textured PEI print surface let's see how it does yeah no it's not even sticking for the first layers and I actually have the nozzle adjusted to where it's almost scraping the bed so that should really be mashing itself into the print surface and it's not even sticking at all 
All right, let's try this again using the build tack type print surface. And just to reiterate, I've got the Z height adjusted to where the nozzle is almost scraping the bed. So it really should be mashing that filament into the print surface. And that is not like the Z height is not the reason that I'm not getting good adhesion. And once again, the skirt itself has come unstuck. So there's absolutely no way this print is going to remain adhered to the bed for the duration of this print. If we take a look, and if we look real close here at what did print, we can see that the these are double lines and they are quite squished together. So it shows you, look at how close the nozzle was right here through this through this area. So I have the correct if anything it's too it's too close to the bed and yet it won't even it won't even stay stuck down. Well, like your mom said, if you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all. I'm really trying to turn over a new leaf and be more positive in my videos, you know? Life is beautiful and I love 3D printing and I want you guys to just, you know, love this hobby as much as I do. So, uh, I don't have much more to say about this printer because I don't have anything nice to say about it. I love that bed. All those magnets and the hold down force of that bed, it's it's phenomenal. Hey, check out the links in the description to the two videos made by very respectable 3D printer channels here on YouTube that have good things to say that got successful prints to happen from this printer. But to my mind, this printer exists because a marketer knows what we are looking for. A marketer knows the feature set that we need and they made a checklist and they handed that checklist to an engineer or a team of engineers and said, try to make this happen for under $2,000. And it's, it's not right, okay? It needs to be the other way. The engineers need to make the best printer they can make and then figure out how much they need to charge for that printer. And that is the way that Bamboo Lab functions. There are PhD engineers at Bamboo Lab who designed the best printer and then they figured out what they, what they had to charge for it. So it's completely the other way around, clearly the way that this printer came into existence. So yeah, I just, I have nothing good to say about it. So I'm done talking. Thank you so much for watching. These are my Patreon supporters. They keep me making videos. I love you guys. Have a great day. See you in the next one. Bye. I'm the YouTube algorithm. You should subscribe to Design Prototype Test, ring the all bell and become a fiscal supporter by clicking on the links. As your benevolent overlord I'm telling you that it will make your life better. Rather than allowing me to keep force feeding you mass audience, vacuous content, you'll actually be shown the interesting stuff that most people miss.